When Bonanza began in 1959, Michael Landon was a 23-year-old starving actor. Where are you? I'm over here. Playing childish games with Brother Haas kept him laughing all the way to the bank. Having remarried, Landon was already beginning to plan his future beyond the Ponderosa. Landon's notoriously contagious laugh brought an unmistakable charm to the series. <laughs> He'd laugh, and he had that wonderful giggle uh, that no one else has. It's just... It's very distinctive. I think you look at I told you that. And he threw himself into the physical side of the show as well. <laughs> Off screen, Landon had fallen head over heels for his second wife, Lynn, whom he married in 1963. His co star, Dan Blocker, was his best man at the wedding. Lynn had a daughter, Cheryl, from an earlier marriage and the family settled into a comfortable suburban home about a half hour's drive from the studio. The newlyweds started building their family right away. They had a daughter, Leslie, and a year later, their son, Michael Landon Jr., was born. The children grew up watching their father transform into Little Joe on television. I've seen him with my own two eyeballs, a little man no bigger than that. My brother, uh, Mike, and I actually thought that my dad um, became very small and would climb in the back of the TV set. That's kind of how we thought about it when we were really little. And we also thought that he could see us because when he would do live shows or parades and things and he'd say hi to, to my brother and I, we would yell back, Hi, Dad. For this week's Hullabaloo, Little Joe of Bonanza, Michael Landon. Landon flew to personal appearances nearly every weekend and was even an occasional guest star on network specials. In 1965, he gamely stepped on stage for the musical variety show, Hullabaloo. Landon was not a singer, and unlike the rest of his Bonanza co-stars, he had little training as an actor. He made do by putting up a tough front. First started Bonanza. When he first started Bonanza, he was a laundry. <laughs> I was an insecure guy. I mean, all of a sudden, I was a big star, and uh, that's tough to handle because uh, you don't know why. So therefore, you, when you're insecure and you you're a star and don't know why. You, you tend to strike out and act like you think a star should act. And if you have any brains, you outgrow it. Morning, little Joe. After six seasons, Pernell Roberts left the show. He had reportedly always felt that Bonanza was beneath him. Oh, you would have died of a real bad case of slow. Landon was never content just to star in the series. He used the Bonanza set to school himself in all aspects of production. We had a gentleman who was associate producer named John Hawkins. At lunchtime, Mike wouldn't eat lunch. He'd go up into John's office, and John would tell him to write a scene about such and such. And Mike would go out and write on the arm of the chair, because no one had a desk for him. And he'd write, take it back in. John would critique it for him, but in a nice way, not being nasty. And that went on for months. And that was a springboard to his, not only his success, but also his power in the, in the industry. Well, I'll get all out of sorts. I'm just trying to be enterprising. He hounded producers until they let him write and direct shows. He loved trying things with new lenses, uh, diopters, and all these things which were new in those days. He loved this experiment. And when he started directing, he'd always have the camera crew bring in different lenses, and we'd do tests and try them out. Brother Haas and I used to come here when we were kids. In 1972, Dan Blocker passed away suddenly at the age of 43 from a lung clot. Mike would have to cry in a scene, and he was asked, how do you, how do you, can you just turn on tears? And he said, yeah, I think of Dan. And, and what he meant to a show. 
Bonanza stumbled after Blocker's death and was canceled the next season. By now, the Landons had welcomed a third daughter, Shauna, but they faced a crisis when a devastating car accident left their oldest daughter, Cheryl, in a coma. Landon made a pact with God that if Cheryl survived, he would make television that made a difference. I think you can do a, to a, a great deal in this world to, uh, to pay back good fortune. Bonanza had made him financially secure enough to never work again. But his bedside bargain had given Landon a renewed sense of direction, and he was about to work harder than ever before. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, where are you going? In the saloon. Hey, Joe, I promised Paul I'd keep you out of trouble. Trouble? Who's getting into trouble? I just got an idea to get us out of trouble. More, more trouble than we got out of yesterday. The 14 years Michael Landon spent on Bonanza had made him famous as a loving son and an impish younger brother. Oh, did I trap him? Did I trap him into a bed? <laughs> he launched Little House on the Prairie in 1974, and the long-running show made him an ideal father figure to a whole new generation of fans. Can we give him names, Pa? Sure. I think we should, seeing as they're part of the family now. I want to call this one Patty. Patty it is. Better name this one Pat. He's a boy. Laura. Well, the child would be in a heap of trouble if she didn't know the difference between boys and girls. Really, Charles? Pat and Patty it is. Everybody up in the wagon. Little House on the Prairie was based on the popular series of books by Laura Ingalls Wilder, who was played by a nine-year-old newcomer named Melissa Gilbert. Made a special report for school, Pa. With snaps and everything. Oh, well, let's take a look at that. He was very much oh. like a, a, um, a second that? father to me. My own father passed away when I was 11. Mm -hmm. So um, without really officially announcing it, Michael really stepped in. Landon picked Melissa to play his daughter because she was so natural and seemed like a real little girl instead of just an actress. Melissa, who had never even seen Bonanza, had no idea she was working with such a big star. She was impressed, though, with Landon for other reasons. He would be smoking. It was real cold. He had these big leather gloves on. And he'd put a cigarette out in his glove and then just, you know, flick the butt away. And I just thought that was... I'd never seen anything like it. That was the coolest. He was the toughest. Landon was earning a reputation as a maverick, but a maverick with a Midas touch. Critics didn't like Little House. They panned it. The network wasn't going to put it on the air. NBC took it to a screening house about three different times, and it got a higher rating than anything that they'd ever had to date. Be back before dark. Love you. Good luck. Little House was a throwback to the perfect television families of the 50s and 60s. By the mid-70s, most producers thought those shows were passe. All in the Family was the top-rated hit, and the Bunkers were a dysfunctional bunch of bigots, dingbats, and meatheads. By contrast, Little House on the Prairie was a personal touchstone for all the family values Landon held dear. I don't see how they can get closer to God than they are right here. Michael's co-stars knew the show reflected the kind of life a lonely little boy from Collingswood, New Jersey had always yearned for. One of the things that Michael was always quite open about was that he had a really horrendous uh, childhood. He was able to take what was a very negative experience and turn that into an experience that's been positive for millions. Little House was also a professional milestone for Landon. Having schooled himself in television production during the Bonanza years, he was now able to take unprecedented control of his show. Well, Ingalls family, as soon as you get done soaking your feet, we got a wagon to unload. Landon single-handedly shouldered the workload of four highly demanding jobs. He performed not just as leading man, but also as writer, director, and executive producer. 
I just don't feel that, uh, that she can make a really terrific product if there's a large committee second-guessing each other all the time. I like input from the people I'm working with, uh, but I don't want a whole bunch of people who really are not part of the company in the first place. Landon kept a grueling schedule. He never needed much sleep and was usually awake at 5 in the morning to work on scripts. By 7, he was on the set, preparing the daily shooting schedule before the rest of the cast walked through the door. I don't think there's any question that Michael had to have a large ego to be willing and able to do the things that he did. But he didn't suffer from his ego like so many people do because he never wore it around with him. He was confident within the framework of, of his knowledge of, of what he was doing, how it would be done. Oh, baby, are you happy? Landon embraced fatherhood both on screen and off. In 1976, Lynn gave birth to their fourth child, Christopher, making the 40-year-old star the father of seven. Having outgrown their modest suburban home, the family moved to an enormous mansion on a seven-acre estate in Beverly Hills. Landon's young co-star, Melissa Gilbert, spent weekends with the family. The house was huge. We ran like banshees through that house, and Mike would hide behind doorways and jump out and scare us. Hide-and-go-seek was fun in our house because we'd have friends come over and they'd never find my brother and I because <laughs> we knew all the great places to hide. It was, you know, it was 15 bathrooms and, I mean, it was, it was a big house. On weekends, the Landon family escaped to a hideaway in Laguna Beach. Though only an hour's drive south of Los Angeles, it was a million miles away from Hollywood and the pressures of stardom. He was wonderful at, at entering into a child's world. Um... He, would, he could find that child inside of him, and I think that's what helped us bond with him so easily. And it was just so easy for him to be with us and play with us, and there was just this intimacy that we had with him. During the week, family ground rules were strict. First off, there was no television. Though Landon had become one of the most powerful stars in television history, his own children were not allowed to watch the medium that had made him rich and famous. The only exception, of course, was Monday night and Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> oh, I love you. I love you too, Pa. Landon never focused on grades, but he did encourage his children to try their best in school. He himself had never been a good student, and he made sure they didn't follow in his footsteps. We definitely had to do our homework. My dad would check our homework, um, which made me nervous, especially with math, because <laughs> he was very quick with numbers and I wasn't. Landon was also trying to teach his children the value of money, which is hard enough for any parent, much less a multimillionaire whose children were growing up with servants and ponies on a seven-acre estate. The children were given chores to do around the house, and Landon was fiercely determined to keep them from turning into spoiled brats teach his children that um, they cannot live their lives being dependent on anyone other than themselves, that they have to make their own way in life. He was a very generous person, but his children <clears throat> grew up thinking otherwise. <laughs> no, no more. I surrender, I can't run another step. Me either. Oh. That's the best day ever, wasn't it, <laughs> Oh, that it was. <laughs> Creating the perfect television family came at the high cost of long hours away from his real-life home. Landon tried to compensate as best he could. Most producers, when they decide to take a, uh, a crew on location, discourage them from taking their families. But Michael was just the opposite. Michael thought of these as family adventures. You know, He'd say, hey, bring the kids. We'll have a great time. And at the end of a long work day, and I mean a long work day, um, he would then go back to the motel and play with the children in the pool and throw them up in the air and find all kinds of funny things to say to them and talk about boogers and, you know, just really relate to them. Hide and go seek, I'm in. One, two. Come in, come in. A playful man, Landon organized ball games and horseshoe contests with his young co-stars in between scenes. <laughs> and he targeted them 
for some of his outrageous pranks. I mean, he used to drive the kids nuts because he would uh, we'd be on location somewhere and he'd start to talk and he'd have a frog on his tongue. He'd put frogs in his mouth. He, <laughs> we had a, a script supervisor. She had this chair with these pouches on the sides and she would carry it from set to, to wherever we were shooting from spot to spot to spot throughout the course of the day. And there was one day where he was sneaking up and putting rocks in the pockets of the pouches. And the chair got heavier and she'd oh, and be lifting the chair over and completely clueless, but of course everybody else knew. <laughs> Thanks to Landon, there were always plenty of outtakes for the gag reel. Now to be milk for the children. I don't care about the children, Butter. Carol. I'm fed up with the kids. <laughs> you are well, right. You gotta look on the bright side. Just think what a big meal we'll have tonight when we eat that sucker. <laughs> oh, my butt. 14 years on Bonanza, it still hurts when I ride. No! <laughs> By the mid-70s, Little House on the Prairie had made Michael Landon one of the most beloved father figures on television. But the exhaustive workload was taking an increasing toll on his long-term marriage to Lynn. In 1976, the Landons discovered that 22-year-old Cheryl, Lynn's oldest daughter from her first marriage, had developed a serious drug habit. Cheryl blamed the problem on painkillers she had taken to recover from a nearly fatal car accident. Landon had zero tolerance for either the abuse or the excuse. It was a very, very tough situation, but it's a situation that, uh, I don't know a family that doesn't have uh, a relative somewhere along the line that's got a, that's got a drug problem, uh, at least one. Uh, it's just something you work out together, and the younger ones learn a lesson, hopefully. The experience was enough to launch a lifelong crusade against drugs, Landon teamed up with Paul Newman's Anti-Drug Foundation, and he appeared with First Lady Nancy Reagan in support of her famously simplistic campaign, Just Say No. Landon used Little House on the Prairie as his personal soapbox. What about the morphine that you took from Dr. Baker? Now, don't lie to me. You took it, didn't you? Didn't you? Yes! I took it. I think Michael uh, wanted to deliver a message in every show. Sometimes that message would be very forthright. I mean, it was, uh, it was uh, dishonesty doesn't pay, or uh, you know, jealousy is, is not something that's going to enhance your life. And, and Michael uh, made you feel him more than anything. Uh, Michael uh, had a wonderful sense of, of getting to our emotional core. I defy anyone to watch A, a Little House on the Prairie and not end up getting teary-eyed and at some point. They were all so moving. And that all came from him. That all came from who he was and, and what he believed in and, and how strongly he wanted to live that. Mr. Ingalls? Often, Landon himself was the one getting teary-eyed because his own emotions were so close to the surface. In this show, he cast his real-life daughter, Leslie, as a plague victim. I wonder if I'm gonna die. My dad got uh, almost too emotional for the scene, and so he stopped it and had to start it again. One more talk of dying, right? He had such a softness about him. Um, it's funny, because I think people often think of their mothers as being the ones that get emotional and show, cry you know, that display crying, et cetera. And it was really my dad in our family. Open up the windows and open up the doors. Let the sun shine in. Laura, Besides being the chief creative force on Little House, Landon also knew how to manage the nuts and bolts. Laura! We both had the same philosophy. You hire somebody, you let them do their job. We also had a couple of rules that went wrong with that. Um, if you want to holler and yell and carry on, you're going to be gone by the end of the day. Don't come back. Bonanza and Little House on the Prairie had made Michael Landon a fixture in people's living rooms for nearly two decades. He was beloved by the audience, but roasted by critics and largely ignored by the industry. It was not uncommon, for example, for him to get the People's Choice Awards, but not get any nominations by the Television Academy. 
And I think that that was hard for him. He continued to portray the ideal husband on television, but off screen, Landon was growing apart from his real life partner.